So with polar coordinates, what we have here is a measure of angles around the origin and a measure of concentric circles. So instead of a graph paper that looks like it looks like this with squares, your graph paper is going to look like this with circles and lines going through the origin. Okay? And the main relationship is based on these equations where if I have a point here, x, y, it's the same thing as a point r theta. Where r is the radial distance and theta is the angle that it makes on the positive x-axis. Now, we didn't get a chance to do negatives, but try to imagine what a negative uh, radius would look like. So if you look at that pointer, that's just pointing in some direction. If it was a negative pointer, then the negative side of the pointer would be coming on the other side, right? So now let's see if we can mimic uh, the activity that these guys were doing on the board on my whiteboard over here, and we'll, we'll see how that's going to work out with negatives. Yes? When you have that triangle there, is that absolutely a right triangle? Or? Yeah, it's going to be a right triangle. In fact, this is going to be your, your y and your x. So what makes trig, you know, when we think about trig is a right triangle geometry and triangle trigonometry, but triangles also, trigonometry also applies to unit circles where you're going to be allowed to take a look at positive and negative values of things. So that's what we'll do. And let's uh, pull out another page over here. These notes will be up online eventually. Let's do another example real quick where you have theta and r. And let's do, uh, those are the volunteers, huh? <laughs> Brian, you going yeah, to? Yeah. <laughs> um, here's a cool one. Let's do, uh, wait. Cosine theta, let's say two cosine theta plus one. Okay, can you guys uh, picture how this graph would look like? Remember your trig uh, shifts and all that stuff? So amplitude of two shifted one. So we'll shift one, amplitude of two, one, two, one, two. So this would be like the value, it's a cosine. So it should look something like that. Okay, so that's how the graph of this, gra uh, this function would look like if we were to draw it on a Cartesian plane. But now let's draw it and treat it like it was uh, polar coordinates. So with an angle, I don't suggest this, but if you have to, let's plot some points, r and theta. When your angle is 0, your r is equal to 3. When your angle is pi over 2, I'll just say it's about 1, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure. I know when it's pi. It's at negative one. That's its lowest point. And then at uh, three pi over two is going to be positive one again, and at two pi is going to be at three. So let's imagine that stick. Let's see if I can do the stick. if 
I could rotate it. Let's do that stick, right? So at this point, I'm at my highest at 3. So radius of 3. I'll put 1, 2, 3 over here. So I'm, I'm at this point. Now, between 0 and pi over 2, I go with a radius from 3 to 1. So I'm going to need to rotate this. And then I'm going to have a radius of 1. Right? Now, I, I probably should have been concerned about this, that at some point my radius is going to be equal to 0. Um, I would ask you to tell me what it is. Can, can, can you tell me what it is? Yeah, it goes into origin, but what uh, what angle is this? When is this thing equal to zero? You guys know your trig enough, well enough? <laughs> so I guess what I'm asking is uh, what. So uh, I want to know when the radius is zero, when this thing is going to cross the x-axis on this graph, and um, cosine theta is a half. So when is it equal to a half? 60 degrees? 60 degrees, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It should be negative, right? I go with 2 pi over 3 and probably one more time at uh, 5 pi over 3. Some other multiples thereof. Thereof. Okay, so now let me uh, let me turn my my stick around to about 2 pi over 3. And this tells me that when my pointer is at 2 pi over 3, I'm at 0. So what's happening here is that I started off with 3, and then I go down to 0, and at some point, maybe it goes down like this until I get to 0. And then I keep doing this until pi, where now my graph becomes negative. So this is the positive direction that it's pointing. The negative direction would be over here. So what do you think is happening between pi, 2 pi over 3 to pi? It's, it's going in the opposite direction. Let's, let's see. Oops. Ah. I was here. And imagine my marker being over here. And as I turn, and I can't do this. This is better with two people on the board. But as I turn, I'm going to start to go negative until... Well, I'll still be negative, but until I get to pi, and that is when my graph goes to negative 1. So opposite of the positive direction of the arrow, I'm going to go to negative 1 on the other side of the arrow. Now I continue doing that until about 5 pi over 3, where I end up back over here. And then I continue. Now I'm back to positive ground again. 
So from zero to positive ground, positive one. And I'm looking at the direction in which the pointer is pointing, right? Not, not where X or Y are. I'm looking at the direction of the pointer is pointing and that's positive one is right going forward. And then I finish off back at three and then I have this shape. So this shape is actually a a what? Cardioid? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that swirl in, in the middle makes it a little bit different. Anybody speak French? Okay, I'll just make it up then. <laughs> it's called a limaçon. Son. Son. This is a C with a little tail. It's French. <laughs> Or if you're a hick, you'd say limacon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're American. <laughs> so um, this is just one of those many different types of shapes uh, that you get from polar coordinates. Okay, let's take a look at your calculators and. When we switch modes from regular function into parametric equations, we saw two others. We saw sweet sequences at the very end, which we're not going to worry about for this class. But the one right before is POL, that stands for polar. So let's turn on your calculators, get to the mode, and change your func, par, to pole. And then press Y equals to. What do you notice? R's now. There's no X, T anymore. X, 1, T, Y, 1, T. And now it says R1, R2, R3. Not only that, <coughs> but if you press that button that says X, T, that button, it's going to automatically give you the appropriate variable that the calculator is looking for, which in this case is theta. Okay, so I just punched theta. This is like that line that uh, Michael and Brian were working on, uh, except this is what happens when your line is too steep. Uh, let's go to zoom. I just put theta zoom, and let's go to zoom standard six. And it's gonna draw out that spiral that they were drawing but if it's too steep, you don't get too much of the spiral. Oh, I stopped at pi over two, or two pi. Let's go to 20. That's big. So anyways, this is going to allow you to draw functions and polar coordinates now with your graphing calculator. Okay, so if you want to see more of this, you would put a multiplier in front of the theta, like r is equal to 0.5 theta or something like that, and that will get you a tighter spiral if you're interested in seeing a spiral. All right, so let's graph that limaçon. What was that, three? So 2 cosine theta plus 1, where's my theta? Mm -hmm. 
Let's try Zoom Fit. So you see how it's being drawn too. It's it, if you watch it being drawn, you can see that it's just moving along. The oh, I, I have I have this going up to twenty or something. So that loop, how did that loop happen? How did that loop happen? Well, that loop happened when it went negative, right? So this point over here where it went negative, that's the point where I drew that loop down here. A cardioid, a cardioid is essentially a graph like this that doesn't have a loop. Any ideas how to draw a cardioid or an example of a cardioid? Plus two instead of plus one. <laughs> plus two instead of plus one. So, as Seuss is saying, if we did this, we should get a cardioid. Can you guys do that in your calculators real quick? So this graph that I drew, it's a graph of 2 plus 2 cosine theta, does not go negative. But it touches the, or, it touches the, uh, the origin, or not the origin, but the, it touches the axis, right? That means your radius will eventually get to 0 as it's turning, and it'll bounce back up. So that looks like it should be a cardioid. Let me try with my calculator and see. And let me adjust my window so it doesn't go to 20. Maybe I should have adjusted my window better. Let's go negative. Two to four, maybe five, and uh, four, negative four to four. Right? That's your cardioid. Any questions? So we could draw spirals, cardioids, limousons, um, circles. How do you draw a circle again? R equals a number. R equals a number and that's going to give you a circle, okay? And um, the other thing is to draw multiple leaf flowers, flowers. So cosine of three theta would draw you a three leaf flower. <clears throat> okay. So let's uh, let's do now that you know how to graph these things, right? You know how to graph these things. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's figure out some calculus. <laughs> oh, before we do calculus, let's. Uh, Take a look at, let's go back to take a look at parametric equations again.
What's this? Circle, right? So this is a circle radius, radius one. And uh, can you tell me more about the circle? Unit circle, radius one. Okay, same thing. Starting point, where does it start? One zero. And more importantly, where, how does it go? Counterclockwise. And then when am I going to get back to one? Okay. Now, what if I want to draw a unit circle in a counterclockwise direction, starting at the point one zero? Two pi times t. So I have my x, instead of just the t, the t that's going to send me from 0 to 2 pi when I go from 0 to 2 pi. I still want the angle to go from 0 to 2 pi, but I want to get there a little bit sooner than 6.28. So I would multiply the t, the parameter, by 2 pi, and that's going to essentially push my, my um, It'll speed up my, my particle moving ar along this circle. Okay. <clears throat> so a little multiplier for the parameter is going to speed up or slow down the path that you're moving. Now, what's nice about this first parameterization of the circle? They both parameterize the same circle, right? I think what's nice about the second one is that my parameterization, my parameter only has to go from 0 to 1. And it turns out that 1 is a nice number. <laughs> 0 is a nice number. 1 is a nice number. It's a good starting and ending point. So that's what's nice about this particular parameterization. What's nice about the first parameterization? It's circular, yeah. Yeah, it's in a circle, and the angles that this is measuring, right, is essentially the t values. So what happens here is that there is actually a relationship between polar coordinates and parametric equations. And the relationship is, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> is that, uh, well, I'll just write it down. Um, if you have a polar coordinate function, r is equal to f of theta. Oh, this was on the page, right? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So if you have a polar coordinate function, r is equal to f of theta, then you can change that into parametric equations. Um, um, x, well, why don't I just copy it? Here it goes. Using that basic formula, the basic relationship between Cartesian and polar coordinates with r, with x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, we can actually just literally replace r with f of theta, and then now I have a new, uh, a new parametric equation that draws out the polar coordinate. <clears throat> So in the example that we had, 
this, let's draw this cardioid now. I'm going to draw the cardioid using parametric equations. So the cardioid is 2 plus 2 um, cosine theta. So if I take that as my function and rewrite now a pair of equations in x and t and y of t where my x is going to be uh, 2 plus 2 cosine t times cosine t and your y is equal to 2 plus 2 cosine t times sine t, then this set of parametric equations will draw exactly what the polar coordinate uh, would, would be drawing out, except I get to trace it using the parametric equations. So just to make things easier, switching off between polar and parametric, let me take out this graphing calculator program and type in this parametric equations and we should get the same cardioid. So it's uh, 2 plus 2 cosine t cosine t and then 2 plus 2 cosine t times sine t from 0. You know, notice how this thing automatically goes from 0 to 1? That See the convenience? But if I go all the way from 0 to 2 pi, then I have this cardioid. So if you have your graphing calculator, you want to change modes again, go back to parametric equations, and then draw your cardioid, you can do that. So the thing is, uh, the parametric equations is a little bit more versatile. Um, because what if for some reason, I don't know what, but for some reason, I decided that I want to draw this cardioid using my parametric equations, but instead of going from 0 to 2 pi, I want to just go from 0 to 1. What do I need to do? Multiply your t by 2 pi, right? Let's do it real quick because we can. So if I just go from 0 to 1 with a regular parametric equations or the polar coordinate change it to parametric, this is what I get. And that's an angle of 1, by the way, you know, rate 1 radians. So if I change my t, to 2 pi t, and my limits are still going to be 0 to 1, now I could draw this thing from 0 to 1, and I get the whole picture. We're taking a picture of this? Yeah, let's do it. So, just highlight. How I can change my parameter by uh, speeding it up, or I can even slow it down. So, let's say I didn't want to get there from 0 to 1, I want to get there from 0 to 10. Then I can adjust it accordingly. Okay? You guys can figure it out how. So, this is what your quiz was about. Yeah. 
So um, on, on the quiz, I realized that the domain meant by G values. Um, what do you call, so that's the domain now, you're talking about G values parameter. What do you call just the, like, the x axis x of t? Like what is the greatest and least um, x of t's that you can have? Or do you still call it the or greatest y of t's? You call them ranges, both of them? I guess you would call them ranges, yeah. The range of x and the range of y. Yeah. I don't think there's a formal name for that. Yeah, I'm a little confused. <laughs> All right, so now let's take a look at derivatives. Because we know how to find derivatives using parametric equations, if we change polar into parametric, then we just use a parametric formula, right? So if we have this information, I'll take a snapshot of this and, and try to walk through the, the link. If you remember in parametric equations, or when you're dealing with parametric equations, the derivative dy dx is equal to uh, dy dt over dx dt. But <coughs> if this is your x and this is your y, just take the derivatives of those things, and you should get this expression. <coughs> so from your parametric equations, when you change your polar coordinates to parametric equations, from parametric equations, now you have um, you have a formula for <clears throat> for the derivative if you have polar coordinate functions. So let's do an example. Uh, let's do the cardioid. By the way, you should figure out what happens if you change a cosine into a sine, and try to figure out what happens when you do when you switch one of the when you switch this into a negative or a positive. Okay, because then you'll see the other types of cardioids that exist. All right, <coughs> so if I go into parametric equations here, my x is going to equal to two plus two cosine theta times cosine theta. My y is going to be 2 plus 2 cosine theta sine theta. And then I want the derivative <coughs> of these things. Well, actually, I don't need the derivative. I was going to go take the derivative of these things using the, the rule, but I, I, there's a formula here for me already. I don't even need to do that. Let's just go straight into the formula. dy dx is going to be the derivative of f. This is f. Which is going to be uh, 2 sine ne negative 2 sine theta times sine theta. <coughs> plus 2 plus 2 cosine theta. times cosine theta. Divided by f prime of a again, which is negative 2 sine theta times cosine of theta plus 2 plus 2, the original f of a, times sine theta. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, in general, what I'll do is I'll ask you to find it at a particular angle. And so you would plug in the angle. So you can either simplify it now or simplify it later. So let's figure out a, a good angle for the cardioid. Uh, there's no good angles here. <laughs> uh, oh, let's, let's say at pi, at pi, pi over 2, right? Because it's not 0 or anything. So let's figure out what happens at pi over 2. So m at pi over 2. <coughs> so let's put pi over 2 in. Um, what's sine of pi over 2? One. 1. Sine of pi over 2, 1 plus 2 plus 2. What's cosine pi over 2? 0. That's gone. This is gone. Uh, sine pi over 2 is 1 minus 2 times 1 times 0. We better not get 0 on the denominator, right? Because this is not a vertical slope just by looking at the graph. 2 plus 2 times cosine of pi over 2 is 0 times sine of pi over 2, which is 1. All right, let's see what happens in this big mess. This whole thing is gone, this is gone, this is gone. So I have a negative 2 on top, negative 2 on the bottom. So I have a slope of 1. <laughs> and we know what point this is, right? This is at 0, 2. So you can either put uh, pi over 2 into the x and the y, or you can just try to figure out using uh, when pi over 2, it's uh, cosine of pi over 2 again, 0. So that's 2 radius, radial distance at an angle of pi over 2. So I would be at this point. So that's a point two zero in terms of x, y, or 0, 2. So then my equation would be y minus y1 is equal to the slope times x minus x1. So y is equal to x plus, x plus 2. And then if I graph y is equal to x plus 2, here I should see my tangent line. And there it goes. Okay, so that's uh, the beginning of the calculus of this. We still need to do the, some areas and areas of sectors and stuff like that. Oh, we still got one minute. Uh, any questions about finding the, the slope using polar coordinates? So it's, it's a matter of just using this formula, and if you don't remember that formula, then you can always backtrack to see how this was derived. Uh, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. r is equal to the function, whatever that function is for in polar coordinates. And then if you remember the dy dt over dx dt is your derivative, that's how it's derived. And then you come up with a formula. OK. Um, yeah, the next one is going to be the areas of the sector. So this is a more interesting area to find. Um, and you don't have to write this because this is where I'll start off next week. This is a more interesting area to find than the area between the curve and the x-axis x because that's uh, when you're moving along this, uh, the curve or you, you're moving along the x-y plane along a circle, you know, you're moving along according to an angle then it's easier to look for, it would be more interesting to look for a, a sector of things instead of uh, some area under the curve. Yeah? You know how last time we kind of got a uh, negative error to minus error um, when we did it parametrically? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a little bit easier. All right. So that's it for today. See you guys tomorrow with some calculus, some more calculus on polar coordinates.